right, so uh, we got another video for you, and I know we've been doing the series on uh, interesting uh, openings and players, and I'm going to throw this one in, in here. Um, it's a sideline variation versus the Slav that I find uh, pretty interesting. Just because it's it's from a rare move order and it's not very intuitive, um, I can't recall ever seeing it in a Slav book, but I mean, I haven't picked up too many. But let's go ahead and jump in and see what I'm talking about. So typically the, the move order that I recommend to reach this with is this exact move order with E3 on move three. Screaming on the announcements. All right, so the reason that this particular the the reason that this particular move order is used is because there's no benefit for Black to take the C4 pawn, and you can capture straight away in one go. And there's no line to where this bishop is going to be able to pin. And already, if that bishop leaves, you have ideas to go Queen B3 and bother the B7 pawn. So, we'll get to the same position from a different move order. This would be by transposition. Now, here's the key, because this is the interesting and underrated move. And you go, well, this looks kind of stupid, I don't understand. Just wait. Because the two main lines in the database for black both deal with playing bishop d6 and then white subsequent play is very easy to remember and understand. It's when they don't play bishop d6 is where I was having problems. Um, so I played with the engine and then intuitively I came up with a line that made sense and then you know you got to plan for everything. So let's first take a look if, if bishop d6 immediately we're going to see the first rendition of the main idea. It's typically bad to play c5 in Slav structures. But here, it's actually good. The main motif is not that you're tickling the bishop. The motif is normally after they move the bishop, they're going to play knight d7 and play e5 and crack open the center. That way that pawn is going to be weakened at that point when they undermine the center with e5. But this particular variation is different because you have the ability to play f4 straight away to shut down the ability for black to play e5. Now, there is no e5 break. So black must know exactly what to do here, which is b6. Otherwise, you're just getting killed. So b4 to support, a5. And there's two different ways to play here. We'll see in the other variation the other way. But a3 is solid. And we're following a game between uh, two Americans, um, International Master Young and Sam Shanklin. And... I like this as the line just kind of is very, very straightforward in regards to development. I mean, you have that, that focal point on E5, and we have ourselves like power knights, basically. The knight was just a beast the entire game. Oh my. And you see, I mean, he just diced him up, like nothing, nothing to see here, and then tears him up in the ending because rooks are good. That should be a rule. No way to defend things. So coming back with bishop d2. Knight bd7 is by far the main line. And after rook c1, we'll get back to the main main line finishing it up with bishop d6, which again is c5, f4 in that plan. But bishop e7 c5 isn't good because of e5 and you're not you're not getting that tempo off the bishop so it's recommended to capture and in practice when they took with the c pawn there's no games in the database for this so i had no idea what to do with it and uh so i had to figure it out and i found this neat idea of development that once we get here you just h3 and queen e1 is the key move in memory marker because I'm looking to play knight e2 and bishop b4 to trade my bad bishop off. And once I realized that this is just a French pawn structure, I was like, you have a bad bishop, trade the bad bishop, got it. And they go knight e4, knight e2, and now we're, he's either going to take on d2, in which case we take and then own the c-file, 
and we play with the knights in the closed position with a better bishop, or we play bishop b4 and get rid of our bad bishop. So there's there's really no no downside there. All right, so coming back, bishop b7 after takes. Takes. So many announcements today. Bishop d3, and Hilberg, you should see the similarities with this position with the Queen's Gambit exchange variation, and you do the exact same plan, except your bishop normally has to come around to defend the d-pawn, but it's already defending somewhat, so it's like an accelerated version of the, the exchange. So you go knight ge2, f3. What if it's slow? Can I get to that position from the other move order? Maybe. We'll take a look, because I, I think you can get to it from that move order. But I really loved, and I mean, there's even ideas here to play like g4 and do that type of stuff. It's just, you know, it's fun for the whole family. What can you do? c4, he's getting space over there, but you get the center. And I remember when I glanced at this game with the engine, there was so many improvements by the two players that um, white is a 2450 and black was a 2650 fide. And uh, like white just made a draw with like no real difficulties or pause in this game. And they liquidate, you know, of course, clip and GG. Bishop stopped the pawns. No point in playing on here. Two players agreed to a draw. But there was many, many improvements White could have. So coming back, after rook c1, we have the main line with bishop d6, which again we see c5, f4. They must play b6. And now we're going to have the secondary idea. a3 is passive. b5 is active. And... Like, I, I'd seen this idea once before. It was in the first um, Carlson and Anod World Championship that they actually got this position from a uh, Bishop F4, Queen's Gambit. That's in vogue. And the pawn's basically not on F4. The knight's on F3. The bishop's on F4, and black's bishop's on E7. Those are the changes in the position, but the pawn structure and ideas are the same. So one idea... That hasn't been played yet. It's bishop b7. And you clip it out. And then you just develop normally. With this big attack. We don't care about you taking that one. And I really like this position for white. Because the knights are annoying here. And the bishops are kind of shut down. It's not often that you see knights dominate bishops. But this is one of those positions. So after a5. Again we see the thematic b5 push. And on captures, in between captures. And now it's all about that C pawn being a bone in the throat, so you support it. And as they're coming around to try to bother you, cement. And now we're just starting an attack on another part of the board. Very straightforward. Notice, like, all four of Black Spiner pieces are, like, stuck within these squares, which you don't see very often. While white, on the other hand, has got some serious space and something he can do with it. It's just every part of the position is working right. And like I said earlier, it's all about the C pawn. And notice how it's restricting all black's pieces. Threatening mate, so he's got to stop it. Threatening mate, so he's got to stop it. Protect the rook, finally. Check yourself. No. All straightforward play. <clears throat> and here, um, White missed, uh, and this was Alexander Rachmanov versus Cheparinov from Bulgaria. Um, F5 was played in the game, which I don't quite understand, because D takes E6 is very straightforward with e takes f7, and then knight e6, where the best black has is giving up the rook. And knight e4, the, the onslaught continues. But to show the full game for clarity, f5. Black gives up that piece. And you have the knights versus the outside pass pawn, which just... Don't do that to yourself, it's never enough. Knight takes f7 because fun reasons. 
GG. Really hard if knight takes to handle that. And I'm pretty sure if king takes, it's rook check, and then you take on g6 with check, and you just win. Intuitively. All right. So that was the line overall. And for clarity, here, here are your major moments. You get the slob structure via the simple move order. Then when you get to this point, bishop d2 is the memory marker. Next memory marker, when you see bishop d6, you hit him with c5 and then shut it down, stopping counterplay with f4. Next memory marker, when you see b6, b4, you hit him with b5, and then the fun stuff's happening. So it begs the question, like if the c pawn's so good, what happens if they take there? We push by first, and this is terribly annoying. a4 comes up next, you know, put the glue in there. Knight b5? That's fair. I mean, there's got to be merits with both moves. Knight takes or bishop takes there. It's just to me, I've already moved that knight. And like we saw in the main game, that knight may be useful for e4 and starting counterplay after bishop takes b5, queen e2. Knight f3, knight e5, then e4, or like... Right, right. It's, you're taken in one go. That's just intuitively, to me, without looking at the engine and, and asking its opinion, uh, I would go with bishop takes b5 just to, to overprotect the pawn. Because I don't know if knight takes b5 and say knight takes c7 following, if that's good. Because notice, even though it's his good bishop on c7, it's not an active piece and it's really shut down by our pawn wall. So, overall, like... Uh, Grandmaster Rachmanov, um, I'd seen him play this bishop d2 variation a number of times in the database, and I just thought it was very simple and interesting. Um, I'll start playing it in Blitz some and see how the results are with it, but I wanted to, to share while we're going through the, the interesting series with players to look at.